Hi, I'm John Copeland, and we're back at Fox Valley Cart for the second in our series of Grand Prix seminars on these videos. In the last video, we talked a lot about how the clutches work, and we, we specifically concentrated on the bully clutch for the jack shaft. This time, we're going to look a little harder at the engine mounted clutches, the LT and the Horseman slash Patriot type clutches. If you're not running a jack shaft, the odds are you're running an LT clutch. Because these clutches are mounted directly on the crankshaft, they don't have the gear reduction from the belt drive, and so they turn a lot faster than the jack shaft clutch. But the operating principles are all the same. As the engine spins the inside of the clutch, centrifugal force from the lever weights squeezes the discs together and transfers torque from the engine to the drum, the chain, and finally the axle. These clutches are a little trickier to install, but it's not difficult if you take the time to get it right. As you can see, there's a taper inside the clutch that fits on the taper on the crankshaft. The little half moon key just positions everything. But the key is just for positioning. It doesn't lock the clutch to the crank. That's done with a fit between the taper on the crank and the taper inside the clutch. In order to make sure that that's a perfect fit, you have to grind the clutch to fit the crankshaft. This is done by putting a little bit of fine valve grinding compound onto the tapered part of the crankshaft. When you buy a new clutch, it'll come with this little yellow tub full of valve grinding compound, but if you don't have any, we'll be happy to give you some. You put a little, just a dab of the valve grinding compound onto the crankshaft, Slide the clutch on and with a moderate pressure, twist it back and forth. You'll feel the grinding effect as the clutch grinds itself to fit the crankshaft. Periodically stop, push the valve grinding compound that came out back into the hole, put it back on and grind some more. When you're done, the taper on the crankshaft should be dull gray and the inside of the clutch should be dull gray as well. When the taper on the crank is dull gray and the inside of the clutch is silver looking, it should be good. Don't forget to clean every bit of valve grinding compound off, otherwise the clutch is likely to fail. When you're done lapping the crank and the clutch together, Carefully clean all the valve grinding compound out of the clutch, including out of the slot where the key is going to go, and off the crankshaft, including out of the slot in the crank where the key is going to go. It's a good idea, if you can, to use a little brake clean to spray off the crankshaft to make sure that you have all the valve grinding compound out of the threads. You'll also need to file down the half moon key so it's not too tall. If you don't file it down, it'll hold the clutch up off the taper, and the first time you hit the gas hard, it'll shear the key off and spin the clutch on the crank. Filing the key isn't difficult, you just have to take a little care. Put the key in the vise and file it stroking gently across the top surface, the idea is to get the key shorter so it doesn't stick out of the crankshaft as much. You can always file a little bit, check it, and file some more if you need to. You can always take more material off, you can't put it back on. Don't forget to deburr the edges before you take it out. When it's properly filed down, it should only stick up out of the keyway on the crank about a sixteenth of an inch. One way to check if the key is properly fitted in, is to install the clutch without the key, measure the distance from the end of the clutch to the end of the crankshaft, then install the key, and reinstall the clutch, and measure again. The, the distance should be the same 
if the key is properly filed. There should be a spacer on the crankshaft before you install the clutch drum if you're using a conventional clutch drum like this one. If, you, if you're using a drum with a needle bearing in it like this, you won't need the spacer. The spacer goes on the crank with the beveled edge towards the engine. Then install the clutch drum, put the key in the crankshaft, and slip the internal parts of the clutch on to the crank. Always align the three tabs on the discs and slip them onto the crank. There are small slots and big slots in the clutch drum. The tabs go in the small slots like that. So just line them up and slip it on. Finally, just thread the clutch nut on. You've probably been wondering what the funny little hex-shaped gold thing is in the toolbox. That's how you hold the clutch while you tighten the clutch nut. You never want to hold the, hold the crankshaft by holding, it on the, holding the nut on the other end behind, under the magneto. This just slips on and these little legs slip in between the heads of the bolts on the clutch. Hold the tool with a wrench and torque it to 420 inch pounds or 35 foot pounds. When you're done, make sure the clutch drum spins freely. If it doesn't, if it binds up the clutch and when you turn the drum it wants to turn the engine, you need a smaller spacer. The clutch needs to be able to float back and forth like this to spin freely. Finally, install the rubber gasket on the cover. Slip the cover onto the clutch, making sure that you capture the clutch drum with the cover, with the lip on the cover, and install the cover screws. These don't need to be super tight. You certainly don't want to warp the cover or damage the gasket, but they do need to be snug. If you're using a small diameter dry clutch, the installation instructions for lapping the clutch to the crankshaft and filing the key are the same. And when you go to install it, there's a special wrench for holding the clutch. while you torque the starter nut. The last step on the LMT is to add oil. The oil in this clutch serves both as a coolant and as heat conductor. Always use genuine LMT clutch oil for these clutches. You should check the oil level frequently and drain and replace it if it turns black or smells bad. Start by removing both oil filler plugs be careful not to lose these you'll need them in a minute then you see this line that's machined in the cover that's your oil level reference line if you Fill through the upper hole, set that line horizontal, fill through the upper hole, turn this a little bit so you can see it better, 
until the oil starts to come out, just starts to come out the lower hole. Right there. Then turn the clutch level so you don't leak any more oil out. And carefully put the cover plugs back in. It's important to know that these are tapered plugs, so you don't want to tighten them real tight. There's no force trying to push them out of the clutch. And if you tighten them real tight, they tend to drive themselves further and further into the cover, and eventually they'll start to interfere with the workings of the clutch inside. So that's all there is to, it, to, to filling the clutch with oil. When you want to check the oil level, set the holes Horizontal, you can do this on the cart of course, pull one plug out and then just gently rotate the clutch until oil starts to weep out of that hole. As long as it's about even with the bottom of the clutch nut, the starter nut, it's fine. If you need to add more oil, you could certainly do that. But remember, there's no seal in the cover or in the drum in back. And so if the clutch is overfilled, it will drip oil out of there. It'll drip a little bit when you come off the track anyway because the oil's hot and it's expanded and it'll be a little bit high. But for the most part, you should be good. Well, that's it for installation. Now start the engine, check for clutch leaks, and get a rough idea of the clutch engagement. As we described in the previous video, all you need to do is hold the brake, start the engine, and hold the throttle wide open and read the gauge. It should be 10,002 or 10,003. Remember, the wet clutch is a lot less tolerant of overheating than the dry clutch, so you only want to hold it for a second or two. Then make the adjustments you need, check again, and finally head out on the track to finish up your adjustment. Don't forget, the clutch is going to be really hot when you come off the track, so be careful when you handle it. Now let's take a look at adjusting the L&T clutch. The L&T clutch adjusts a lot like the Bully and the Horseman clutches, except for two things. The clutch mechanism and the adjusters are hidden inside the cover. And tightening the springs requires you to turn the adjusters counterclockwise to raise the engagement speed. I know that's the opposite direction of the dry clutches, and it sounds confusing, but we'll get to that in a minute. To adjust the LNT, begin by rotating it until one of the cover plugs, the oil fill holes, is at the top. Then take that plug out. It's a good idea to have somebody hold the brake, because since the clutch is attached to the axle with the chain, if somebody moves the rear wheel, it's going to move the clutch around and you may lose oil and it's also harder to keep track of what you're doing. Now, if you put a 5 sixteenths hex key in the starter nut, now you can turn the engine over so you can turn the inside of the clutch while you're doing that. Inside the clutch there are four little towers like this that have the spring in them and the adjuster screw on the end. The first thing you have to do is turn the clutch while you're looking in the oil filler hole until you see one of the adjusters come up to the top. Right there. Then reach in through the hole Feel until it engages the screw on the end of the adjuster, and if you want to raise the engagement speed, turn it counterclockwise. Now, without moving the clutch, without moving the outside of the clutch, turn the engine 90 degrees, and the next adjuster will come into view. And again, reach in, Find the hole, turn it 
counterclockwise to raise the engagement, and so on as you go around the clutch. Most of you will have four spring clutches. There are some six spring clutches out there. Just make sure you know which one you have so you know how many springs you have to adjust. Make sure you adjust all the, all the adjusters the same amount and always check the oil level like this. before you put the plug back in. Keep in mind that when the cart comes off the track, the clutch is gonna be hot, really hot. Be careful and don't get burned. It's a good idea to let it cool down for a minute or two before you start to work on it. Let's take a moment and I'll show you why the L&T clutch adjustment seems backwards from what you might think. As you, as you turn the adjuster screw counterclockwise, it pushes the spring down, and that creates more pressure holding the discs apart. Conversely, if you turn the screw clockwise, it retracts the spring and puts less pressure on the clutch discs. One advantage of this system is that if you get lost, if you don't know where you are adjustment-wise, you don't have to take it apart and measure anything. All you need to do is turn the springs, all, turn this adjuster all the way clockwise until it stops. Then turn it counterclockwise until you feel the pressure on the spring start, and then put two, one, two and a half turns in and you should be at a pretty good starting point. Maintenance on the L&T clutch is pretty much just like the maintenance on the bully clutch. You need to measure the distance between the discs with a feeler gauge. Typically 30 to 35 thousandths is about where you want to be. If it gets to be much bigger than that, as the discs wear, the clutch starts to get lazy in engagement. If you do need new discs, just bring the clutch into the shop We'll be happy to replace them for you. And just like with the bully clutch, for Grand Prix teams, there's no charge for that service other than the cost of the parts. Don't forget to keep an eye on the oil level and don't get that down too low. And if you do have new discs put in the clutch, it's a good idea to fill the clutch with oil and let them soak overnight before you run them on the track. One last thing. The bully clutch has an 18 tooth sprocket and will likely never wear out. But the L&T and the small dry clutch have 10 tooth sprockets, and these take a lot of abuse. Plan to put a new drum on your engine mounted clutch before the race. Set the money aside for that and go or go ahead and buy it, but never take the chance on starting the race with a used clutch drum. Over time, the teeth wear like this, and then they start to pull over like you see these are hooked and finally, they simply strip off altogether. It's a relatively small investment and the failure risk for a used clutch drum is pretty high. Don't ruin your Grand Prix race with a predictable, preventable failure. Well, that about does it for the L&T clutch. Never forget, the clutch needs to be locked up at least as much as it slips. If the clutch is getting too hot, you can Deal with that by adding some more teeth to the axle, but typically the problem is the driver isn't driving hard enough and he's not using full throttle. The answer is to drive harder. The clutch typically gives teams more trouble than any other single component. If you have questions, if you have problems, please stop in the shop and see us and we'll be happy to help. Next time we'll take a look at the Yamaha engine and carburetor. In the meantime, Feel free to share this video with your Grand Prix friends, like us on Facebook, and we'll see you next time.